Hello everyone. This is the first in a series of lectures covering chapter 17. So we talked about transverse waves last chapter. Now we're going to be talking about longitudinal ones, specifically sand waves, but we'll see that some of the formulations that we come up with can describe not only all longitudinal waves, but also uh, some properties extend to all kinds of waves, mechanical or any electromagnetic. Yeah. I'll be careful to be specific when a formula is actually about sound waves or not. Also, please enjoy the picture of a dog looking into a gramophone. It's quite charming. So a sound wave is a fairly broad definition. Basically, any longitudinal wave you know, that propagates along its uh, its oscillations move in the same direction of propagation. Basically, that can be uh, picked up as a sound since these longitudinal vibrations can pretty much travel through air or water or anything in your household really can transfer these kinds of waves. So eventually, right, they get to the air, they get to vibrate the air, and if that reaches our ears and or ears register those vibrations um, into the inner ear, and our brain interprets the vibrations of those air particles as sound. So all that we perceive as sound is really just air particles vibrating. And then a sound wave, like a any wave, is just oscillations of particles as they transfer energy through through their medium. So the interesting thing, though, is that now it's not just uh, a rope, you know, moving up and down uh, as pulses get sent through it, but now you you have this sort of compressions and expansions that happen cyclically through a medium like air as the sound wave travels through it, and you can set up in the same way that we set up a sinusoidal wave through a string. We can also set up a sinusoidal wave or ripple through um, a medium like air. And it'll turn out then that you can talk about the changes in density and pressure of that medium as the pulses move through it. And they'll have a sinusoidal shape. So you'll have these sort of pulses, ripples of, you know, compression and also bits where the, the gas is more spread apart, uh, moving outwards from the source. So this is why sine and cos functions are so useful because they can basically describe the propagation of all waves with respect to the displacement from equilibrium or even in the case of sound waves, how they change uh, in terms of pressure and density. When it comes to, to sound waves, there's actually a big, big range. And we can only really hear a range of frequencies sort of in the middle of that. And that's why we call that audible waves. And well, anything we hear is an audible wave. We'll talk later about the, the scale of audible waves uh, being measured in sound level, being a more reasonable scale than just talking about the sort of power of a sound wave. It's more reasonable to talk about sound level since power can vary so much, but sound level makes sure that it's uh, easier to talk about something being loud or quiet. Then anything sort of below the frequencies we can hear. So these are sound waves where the pulses are really, really far apart. Um, we call them infrasonic waves. So, so below infra. And elephants can hear stuff we, we can't. And these waves actually uh, have an easy time propagating through air and can be heard if you're an elephant uh, many kilometers across. Having big ears helps them. Now, ultrasonic waves, these frequencies are so high pitched that our ears cannot pick them up. And this is why dog whistles, while you can't hear them, your dog can. And even like uh, ultrasonic imaging to sort of send waves into the bones and tissue and scan for the, the overall shape of that bone and or tissue is using ultrasonic waves to just be transferred into the body through the skin and get reflected back to the machine to, to get a medical image. 
So let's let's set up like a really simple transverse wave, a, a simple longitudinal wave. You remember how the easiest um, transverse wave we could do was just kind of shake a rope and send the pulse down, you know, like we're at the gym working out on the battle ropes. Well, for, for a sound wave, um, it's not as a CC as shaking the, the air around this. So we're going to start with like a really simple case where we have this sort of gas chamber of compressible gas. And that just means that the gas is willing to um, be compressed. So we have a piston on the left end. And what we can do is we can just move the piston to the right and that'll send the pulse through. Since moving the piston essentially compresses the gas closest to it, since we're kind of reducing the volume it has to work with. And then by conservation of momentum, the that momentum of the particles kind of getting displaced and compressed to the right gets carried all the way um, throughout the, the chamber. So initially, um, and again, this is kind of like an ideal situation where the gas is just uh, peaceful and a uniform density. So obviously in the real world, things are non-ideal. The gas is, even at rest, it's a lot more chaotic. Particles are still bumping all over the place. But this this model here is, you know, a good place to start with because you can always tack on, you know, real world uh, effects. So things are normal, but then you move the piston and so you're compressing the gas and becomes, well, uh, the gas then immediately next to the piston kind of gets shifted to the right. And so, what you have then is sort of like this exodus of gas particles from here, kind of getting pushed to this region here. So that ends up accumulating gas. And now you have more density here, more pressure, which having a higher pressure area, a lot of the gas will then um, kind of push down to the right where it's less pressure. And in doing so, in pushing that, then the gas particles on this over here will move a bit to the right, creating a um, higher than the area further along. And meanwhile, while they do that, uh, since this particles here kind of kind of kept the push going to the right, this is going to alleviate some pressure um, next to the piston. And so the, the particles will kind of resume their um, sort of default state, you know, being less compressed. But meanwhile, though, this kind of pulse of compression gets kind of moving to the right, compressing the gas. So this sort of the, the the medium itself kind of keeps pushing the particles um, to the right, kind of creating a moving area of compression. But the particles themselves actually again just kind of just kind of hit their neighbor and then kind of go go back go back to the left. They sort of um, resume rest since they're really not um, wanting to move too far from their equilibrium position. They they have a sort of notion of um, elasticity where if you nudge them, they'll try to fight back in the same way that a spring does when you when you stretch them. But the point being is um, what this results in is you just sending a pulse through to the right where the particles kind of nudge each other a bit to the right. And while well, every particle on their own essentially returns to equilibrium, that nudge gets passed through particle to particle. Um, kind of like you know a wave at a baseball game. And so the overall pulse gets sent along. And yeah, so basically at the, at, at the core of the pulse, then you have this moving region where at any point in time, right, in this the center of this region here of this pulse, the particles are really close together. And therefore, you have a lot more pressure, a lot more density in that region. And then once you are done nudging the, the piston, right, you, you let go of it, then the kind of compression, kind of the pulse moves to the right. And it turns out that there, there's a speed to this pulse, a wave speed that is actually constant. And we'll see that like in launch it in transverse waves, the speed's determined by the medium you're in. So we could keep moving the piston right, left and right, left and right, essentially sending periodic pulses. And what this creates is the equivalent of a sinusoidal wave for a uh, rope on a string, but now it's um, transverse wave in a gas in one direction. 
And the idea is that you're shaking the, the piston left and right in simple harmonic motion. So cyclical motion creates a cyclical wave pattern, a cyclical series of pulses, each one you know, with uh, equal distance apart uh, from each other. So you can measure a wavelength and there's a periodicity to it. There's a frequency to it, but still you have this um, constant speed at which everything moves to the right. So note that since you're sending multiple pulses, you're kind of having this multiple regions of compression that are basically getting sent along. And in between those regions, you have uh, regions where you don't have compression, where the there's less pressure, there's less density than equilibrium. And somewhere in between, the, the particles are in the middle, between being less dense than normal and more dense than normal. They kind of go in the middle. But as the pulses keep passing, right, different, part, different parts of the gas um, achieve uh, these points of compression or being spread apart. So as the cycles continue, the gas keeps stretching and compressing. And so these compressions move through the tube as the piston pushes. So every time the piston pushes to the right, there's a compression. But every time the piston then, since it's doing cyclical motion, the piston goes right, creates compression, but then as it pulls back to the left, during those moments, um, it frees up some space. So the gas immediately close to it um, basically expands in that area. And so the pressure and density fall below equilibrium. And that's, that's shown here, or okay, you have the, part, the the piston here is moving to the right, then it's let go, moves back to the left and in doing so this area here, which was initially compressed, uh, expands and is much um, less dense than it was at rest when you weren't not even moving the piston. And then you move the piston back, you send another pulse, you re rest and then keep sending pulses forever. And in the same way that you could measure wavelength by the distance between two peaks, you can take the uh, distance between two points of uh, max compression here and measure that, that's a wavelength. And by the way, uh, we don't talk about troughs here, we talk about rare fractions, rare fractions where you, you have these regions of low pressure and rare factions follow compressions, like peaks follow troughs. And again, they all move as part of one wave. So you see the similarity then between a longitudinal wave here and a transverse wave, where in the transverse wave, we had peaks and troughs. And now in the longitudinal wave, we have points of compression here, like peaks, and rare faction here, like troughs. So, like I said, then you can measure any two consecutive points of compression or rarefactions and get the wavelength. Similarly, you can measure, you know, how long it takes for areas of compression to, to pass a single point. Um, and you can get the period and frequency then of the wave. And if you actually observe, so if you match in the medium here and you, you split it up into rows, into starting to columns like books in a bookshelf, um, each each book would be a slice of the tube where you know the some some set of particles a column of, of particles is. You'll see that as the pulses move through the gas chamber, these particles are oscillating left and right in simple harmonic motion. In the same way that the particles on a string were moving up and down in circular harmonic motion, well now the particles of the gas move left and right in that motion. So then we can actually describe you know for any for any particle in, in the gas. We can actually describe how it displaces from its own equilibrium position uh, using a cosine function. And you'll see then this kind of similar to the vertical displacement of particles in a string when you send a sine wave. By now, this, this displacement, of course, is parallel to the uh, direction of the wave. So, we, we use a cos function sort of um, similar to the sine function, basically. It's still describing, you know, a cyclical motion. Um, in this case, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to mean the particles are vibrating left and right. It just means that uh, it's not vibrating parallel, sorry, perpendicular to, to the propagation anymore. So we don't use Y, now we use S to talk about its um, change in position. 
So the thing is that right, because you're using cos, that means that um, at your initial conditions of time zero and position zero, uh, you start a max compression. So the, the initial position is actually right here at the very start, right? So x zero means right that the beginning, um, the beginning of motion, and t zero is also indicating the beginning. So at that point, that's when the particles over here are um, are displaced the most because they're displaced all the way to the right, uh, where they create this area of compression. And the, the function has the same elements you've seen before. You have the wave number here in the uh, position term x and an angular frequency term uh, for the time term t. So this term here, again, accounts for how long the waves are, the distance between the uh, compressions. And then this term here accounts for uh, how quickly consecutive pulses move through a point. So this determines the frequency. This is the wavelength term. And uh, big thanks to Flipping Physics for making this wonderful GIFs. So you see here, we have on the left here, we have this piston here moving cyclically. And so it hits the beginning of the of the chamber here, all these particles at the beginning next to the piston kind of shoves them to the right and they compress against the other particles in this region. And that sends a shock wave to the right. But then as the piston right releases to the left, uh, the initial particles you know, are happy to, to go back to where they were, but then they get pushed back and so on. So you'll note too that each kind of segment here um, moves left and right. Uh, it doesn't keep moving. It's a pulse that kind of keeps getting sent, but the particles themselves just keep moving left and right. So if you just highlight any element, right? So specify X here, which is this blue point, you'll see that the particles themselves don't actually travel that far. And what's cool is that um, it doesn't have to, you know, nearly a piston, you can see this sound speaker here. You might have seen this in cartoons where they kind of seem to be thumping. Well, they are, right? They're essentially pushing air particles out in a cycle. They're acting like a piston. So all the air around them kind of starts pulsating outwards. So then we can also describe the wave rather than it's, um, the change in position of any element along the tube, we could talk about the uh, variations in pressure um, since, right, as, as the pulses keep traveling, then at different points in time, different areas of the gas chamber have more pressure than others. So you can talk about then how the pressure changes from the pressure at equilibrium over time and on what position on what area of the chamber you're looking at. So to talk about that, then you can you can use this formula here for pressure variation, which depends now on a sine function rather than a cos. And the reason that is is because the the regions where you have max pressure change are the regions of the least displacement. Because when there's the least displacement, um, that means that everywhere around it, there's the most displacement. So in the areas of least displacement, um, those gas particles are getting sandwiched by the gas particles on their left and their right, generating this high pressure area. So you can then talk about the sort of wave function, either using the position formula S or, um, sorry, the displacement formula for S as the particles move left and right, or you can talk about the uh, pressure changes. And basically the biggest difference besides you know, the sort of amplitude of oscillations for one and the amplitude of pressure changes for the other is that one has a cos function and one has a sine function. So <clears throat> you note that using a cos function, you start off at a maximum and then drop down to zero while the sine function starts from zero and it rises to a maximum and then falls back down. So they're about 90 degrees out of phase, exactly 90 degrees out of phase, right? Because cos and sine, they're almost the same function, just that the sine is a cos function, just shifted 90 degrees to the right. So like I said, um, 
in it, at the at the origin, right? You have a point of max displacement because all these particles are getting pushed to the right. Um, but then, at a point of ninety degrees uh, of face here, these particles are not displacing at all. So they're getting sandwiched by the particles on the left, and also the particles on the right are kind of coming in the middle. So this creates a high pressure area, and that's reflected on the function for the pressure change, where you have a maximum at this point, since you have this big sandwich of particles coming in. But remember, though, that um, this is just a snapshot, right? So as time passes, then the areas of max and minimum pressure change uh, will shift, as shown here. So you'll note that um, in the split second that you have a high pressure area, right? The high pressure areas are formed because the area, the, the particles on the left have displaced a great deal to the right, and the particles on the right are kind of coming in to, to the middle. But the actual particles like right in the middle in the right high pressure area actually are not moving that much yet. But just a second later, though, the particles in the high pressure area right in the center will get shoved to, to the right, will send the pulse to the right, and then they'll come back to the left and keep sending pulses back and forth. So quick quiz here. Uh, we're just going to blow atop the top of an empty soft drink bottle. You may have tried that before. It kind of makes like a flute sound. And what that does is, well, it just sends a, uh, a sound wave to, to the bottom of the bottle here. And the question is, okay, once you go have your pulse here, gets to the bottom, what happens to the air particles right there with respect to their equilibrium position and pressure? So uh, the particles at the bottom, you know, they get hit by this pulse and there's nowhere for them to go. So they're not gonna displace, um, but also as the pulse hits them, that means that there's a shock wave getting passed down to the bottom, which means that they're gonna get sandwiched by the sound particle, by the, uh, air particles on top of them. So the air particles right on top of them will kind of push down to the bottom, creating a high pressure area. So then they'll receive the pools, reach maximum pressure, but they have nowhere to displace. So the answer is C. And that's about all for now. Uh, please join me when we'll be talking about section 17.2 in the next one.